Good morning. Welcome to the June 21st Public Health Nursing Webinar. So glad you could join us today during this very busy time. I know um, there's a lot of busy times uh, throughout the year and certainly the end of the fiscal year um, and the beginning of the new fiscal year is always a busy time, uh, both in Frankfurt and I'm sure where you are. So my name is Joy Hoskins. I'm the Chief Nursing Officer for the Department for Public Health, and we're so glad that you could join us today. If you have uh, some of your staff who was unable to join us, uh, please know that this session will be archived and will be made uh, readily available within the next day or two. And I'll send out that email to let you all know when it is available via archived webcast. Our first session that we're going to have today is a reportable disease update, and we're thrilled to have um, several of our reportable disease staff, nurses and epidemiologists with us today. Uh, this session is approved for 1.2 nursing CEs, as well as 1.0 ERRT credits. So I hope for uh, those of you all who are ERRT nurses or your regional EPIs or other EPIs that you may have in your agency, I hope that they were able to join us today for this session because there'll be a lot of great information that will be uh, disseminated to you on, on uh, the two diseases, uh, cholera and campy. And I'm gonna say campy because I can't say the full name. <laughs> so thank you for allowing me to do that. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce <clears throat> Tracy Vaughn who is uh, one of the nurses who will be uh, joining us. Uh, and she's here in our room. And so I invite Tracy to come on up and we'll get your presentation pulled up here for you. And then Jennifer Corey is also going to be joining her in part of the presentation. And Jennifer um, is an epidemiologist in the reportable disease section. So first of all, we're gonna start out our morning talking about cholera. So Tracy, thank you for being with us today. Good morning. All right. Let's see here. All right. For many of you, I have talked to you on the phone or I have talked to you by email. So I'm really excited to get to talk to you today about cholera and other vibrio illness surveillance because many of you all have called me or emailed me with questions. So hopefully today after we Go through this presentation many of your questions will be answered um, jennifer is going to talk after me and hopefully um, you all will hold your questions to the end and we can get some of those answered if we don't get them during the presentation okay so our course objectives today are going to be reporting cases of vibriosis completing data entry and NEDS, and filling out the covis form which we're going to go through in detail all right, first of all, um, we have to correspond with the reg and we have to report cholera and vibriosis within one business day. And when you go to your case definition, you will be able to see um, what consists of a probable or a confirmed case of cholera or vibriosis. Now, we in the reportable disease section did an enteric webcast um, through a NEDS-based training, which is still available on Kentucky Train that you can access now. And that consisted of several of our foodborne and waterborne diseases, um, not just Vibrio, but that was available for Salmonella, STEC, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, Shigella, and some of our other nurses and epidemiologists were available for that um, NEDS-based training. So I encourage you to participate in that if you've not done that before. That will help you for entering uh, labs that you may have trouble with, particularly STEC, which I know I get a lot of frequent questions with. Now today, as I said, we're going to go through the uh, cholera and vibrio fillable PDF, but that is available here on the link if you do not currently have access to that. Okay, now when we talk about NEDS entry, that's going to be based on 
your lab report that you're looking at. And if you see in the pictures, it's a pretty uh, common shaped um, organism. And I like the Parahemolyticus that you see here and the Planificus. Now that one looks a little bit scary when you see that uh, black organism there. Okay. First of all, when you're talking about Vibrio, it is a modal uh, gram negative uh, rod here, typically found in your marine environment. Several species are capable of causing illness in humans, both extraintestinal and intestinal. And you can have a soft tissue infection, septicemia, eye, or an ear infection. And a lot of times when we see the ear infections, you're looking at your Vibrio algenolyticus um, species. Gastrointestinal illness is most commonly associated with your Vibrio cholerae, Parahemolyticus, Flamificus, Fubalus, um, and again, your Algenolyticus infections. And they're associated with your consumption of contaminated foods, such as your raw oysters that you'll see oftentimes in your coastal regions. But um, you will also have cases um, where you can eat raw oysters here in Kentucky. We have had cases um, right here in Kentucky where um, we have had um, Consumers have raw oysters and they've become very, very ill. All right, now I'm not gonna read off slides verbatim except for this one right here. And I want you to pay particular attention to every word that I say here because this is one of the things that I get more and more questions about, okay? So Vibrio cholera is the only Vibrio species that cause endemic, epidemic, and pandemic cholera. There are three major subgroups of Vibrio cholerae, Vibrio cholerae 01, cholerae 0139, and Vibrio cholerae 901 and 0139. Now your 01 and 0139 are associated with epidemic or pandemic cholera, okay? Now that is not endemic here in the US, okay? So nine times out of 10, we are not gonna have cholera reported here in the US. Your GI panel detects but does not differentiate all three subgroups. So cholera is endemic in many parts of the world. So new outbreaks are often associated with natural disasters or a social upheaval. Disease remains a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. So when you think about cholera, for example, you might think about like the earthquake that occurred in Haiti a few years ago. And we actually had a case that we thought was cholera um, where one of our cases here in Kentucky had traveled to Haiti during that time, okay? But most of our cases that you see are not going to be associated with cholera. It's going to be a vibriosis case. Okay, now one of the other things that you are seeing um, with your lab reports now are what we call culture independent diagnostic tests, CIDT for short, all right? And a lot of our practitioners are very, very happy with these tests because they test for many bacteria, parasites, and viruses all at one time. So when you see Vibrio on here, you see the Parahemolyticus, Fulnificus, Cholerae, um, all in one category. Now, one of the other things that I'm going to point out on here just while we're looking at it are our E. coli because I get lots and lots of questions about that. And the reason I'm mentioning that today is because um, we are going to try to do a public health nursing ITV just on the E. coli for those of you who are interested because, as I said, that's one of the questions that I get oftentimes is, Tracy, is the EPEC or ETEC, is that reportable? I don't know what that means. Can you help me enter that into NIDS? So just stay tuned and we will try to do a public health nursing ITV um, just for this in the near future, okay? All right, now, for those of you who are interested in the CIDT, this is what this consists of. It's a comprehensive test and it tests for 13 bacterial, five viral and four parasitic targets all at one time. It's accurate and it's fast. So providers really, really like this and the runtime is an hour. They like it because they get their results really quick. They don't have to wait on, you know, what nurses really like, which was the old, you know, tried and true culture. You know, we like that, that's what we're used to. Or as I should say, as old nurses, you know, you get a culture in what's like 48, 72 hours, but you know, you know, you've got a true answer there, all right? But with these CIDTs, um, a lot of our cases are not confirmed based on the CIDT. So we can't confirm vibriosis based on a CIDT result. All right, now, 
this is where it's going to get interesting. I've got some example reports to show you, and that's where, um, you know, I get a lot of questions from nurses, it's, which is fine, but that's why we're going to go over it today. I have several examples to show you, um, which I think are really good examples of what you're getting in at the local health department. So this is an example of a CIDT test, which indicates that the patient could be infected with any Vibrio species. This case would need to be entered in NEDS under Vibriosis, okay, because it shows that Vibrio is detected, Vibrio cholerae was not detected. So it would be entered as Vibriosis here. All right, now on this next one, I know it's a little bit difficult to see, and this is unfortunately not just because it's scanned in. A lot of our reports come through this way now, unfortunately. So this CIDT test result indicates that the patient could be infected with any Vibrio species, including but not limited to your Vibrio parahemolyticus, fulnipicus, or cholerae. Now remember, this is your non-01 and your non-0139, so it's non-toxigenic, so it will not be reported as cholera. This is going to be reported as vibriosis. Now, with this result, it does not mean that this case has vibrio parahemolyticus or vibrio pulnificus, okay? This is just saying that this test, this CID test, has the ability to test for the parahemolyticus and pulnificus but the case is actually being just reported as vibriosis. So this species has not been identified yet, okay? Now, in the second part of this slide, you see the laboratory information, which is just part of the fillable PDF. So the reason that this is keyed in down at the bottom is it's showing that the species is not actually identified in the CIDT, because remember, the CIDT does not have the ability for culture confirmation, it does not have the ability to isolate the organism, okay? So it's just telling you that the Vibrio itself has been detected. All right, now with this example, it's showing you on the top part, it's positive for Vibrio species and it's positive for Vibrio cholerae. And you're like, oh my gosh, what does that mean, okay? Again, you're going to report Vibrioses. You are not going to report Vibrio cholera. Why are you not going to report Vibrio cholera? Because cholera is not endemic here in the U.S. If our state lab has not isolated a toxigenic cholera, do not report cholera in NEDS, okay? You're going to report your case as Vibrioses, okay? Because with the CIDT, again, remember, they do not have the ability to speciate the organism. They are only telling you that Vibrio species is here, okay? So on the next one, uh, right underneath that, it's just another example telling you that this one was positive for Vibrio cholera. And again, when you go back and you look at the GI panels, remember on them that they have the ability to detect more than one organism. So for example, they may detect Salmonella and Campy at the same time. They also might detect Vibrio in another organism at the same time. So if that's the case, you have to create two investigations in NEDS. So keep that in mind as well, okay? All right, now, with this particular slide, this is something that you're gonna see as well. The CIDT is positive, but at the Division of Lab Services, which is our state lab, they may not get any Vibrio. The Vibrio is not isolated, for example. Now, that doesn't mean it wasn't there, but what that means is the case is going to be determined as probable. So the case investigation still needs to take place. The case investigation needs to take place as soon as you get your preliminary lab. It just means that the state lab was not able to isolate it, okay? Now, that may happen because maybe something happened during transit, um, but for whatever reason, the state lab was not able to isolate uh, the organism itself, okay? So the case would be determined as probable and it would still be submitted to CDC as such. Jennifer? So I'm just going to quickly go over some different things that are noticed on, or have been noticed on forms in the past. Um, specifically legibility, professionalism, and later incorre incorrect or incomplete forms. So on this particular example, shown in the red boxes, we have pointed out any 
handwritten words that are kind of hard to read. They may be kind of squished together or something of that nature. Um, it just kind of makes it hard to interpret the information that's on the form and to pass along the CDC. So on, in the red box on this slide, we want to point out that in order to be more professional, you either would not have a scribble on your form or you would cross it out with a single line and initial that it was an error, not scribble it out and write error next to it. And I just want to point out the bottom left corner of this um, picture showing that it is still kind of hard to read what was handwritten on the form. So now I'm going to go through some examples of incorrect or incomplete forms. So in this picture, we have an example form that was missing some things and had some things that were incorrect. So in the yellow boxes, it shows that there was no NEDS ID, no outreach ID. Um, even though the occupation was unknown, it was left blank. And some different things were incorrect on this form, including that the sex, even though you wouldn't know this about the case, was incorrectly entered. Um, and just keep in mind that even if you don't know something, you can put unknown because that is an option on these forms. It is better than leaving it blank and not knowing why it's blank. So in this example, it's kind of going back to what Tracy was saying about your tests kind of being misinterpreted when you later translate it onto the form. So even though this test is showing that any of those species were detected, it doesn't specify which species. So when it comes to entering in your laboratory information, instead of choosing Parahemolyticus and Vulnificus, you would actually choose Vibrio species not identified because you don't know which species it is. It wasn't cultured, it was just a PCR test. So this slide um, just shows that whoever was filling out this form didn't necessarily have all the information when they filled it out or they didn't go back and check. So on the form, they checked that a culture was not done. However, the specimen was sent to the state lab and a culture was attempted and no vibrio was isolated. So that's what those red boxes are pointing out. And then the red box on the DLS report is actually just pointing out what number is the outreach ID. So we're just kind of going to go through the fillable PDF, which Tracy pointed out the link earlier and is on the I don't know which slide it was on. It was one of the first slides in the presentation. Um, and this form is good through 2019. So on every form, there is a top section where you want to put your state, your year, the age of the case, the sex of the case, and the first three letters of the last name. You don't want to leave anything blank. If you have to, put unknown. And then in the laboratory information area, you want to keep in mind that those results are culture or CDT, CIDT as applicable. And as you can see, nothing was chosen on this form. On this slide, we want to point out that the specimen was received at the public health laboratory, which means a state lab ID should have been put on the form. And for the culture result, if it was positive, you would want to write what the species is using the key from the previous part of the form, the three-letter key. And if you had two specimens, you would put the information for the second specimen under number two. Again, pointing out at the top of the form, you would put the year, state, age, sex, and last three, sorry, first three letters of the last name of your case. All of this information is important to know what treatments were done, especially the dates. You don't want to leave any dates out. And if you don't know, you would put unknowns rather than just leave it blank. Again, this section is important. You want to know what signs and symptoms your case was having, as well as their medical history. And the epi section, you want to make sure you know if the case traveled, since as Tracy mentioned earlier, a lot of cases are travel related. This form, or this part of the form, shows more information related to the epi side of the investigation, including what foods the case may have eaten, especially seafood, because we want to know if the seafood got them sick. And we want to know more about the recreational water exposure or any water exposure, 
especially if they travel, to kind of learn more about the cause of their illness. And always put the person completing the section at the bottom and which agency they're from. Turn it back over to Tracy. Thank you, Jennifer. Jennifer did a great job. Um, I'm just gonna add that it is really important to put the specific seafood because, for example, if they had oysters, you know, we may need to get environmental involved if we need to get tagging information. Um, a lot of our cases um, may have eaten oysters and we like to do traceback information to um, get the particular bay that they may have been harvested from. If we have someone who had uh, recreational water exposure, for, for example, if they have a wound or whatnot, um, we want to make sure that that wound is healing appropriately. A lot of these cases get really, really ill. Um, we've had cases to expire, unfortunately. So we really want to make sure that they're getting uh, the correct treatment that they need. So um, with this uh, last section that I'm going to do, I want to let you know how important it is that these forms are completed, um, as Jennifer said, not only legibly, but completely, because these forms are reported to CDC. We provide a weekly update to CDC um, by email, and then all the forms are transmitted to CDC. And it is important that they're done legibly, because when they're not, then they email me back if they can't understand something. And all of this information is transmitted, and I'm gonna show you exactly what they do with this information. So on this particular slide, you can see that um, when this presentation was done, Kentucky had already had 10 cases this year. That's quite a bit for a non-coastal state. You know, when you think about Vibrio, you may think about Florida, or you may think about Texas. Well, Kentucky ranks up there pretty good when you think about, like I said, a non-coastal state, because we have to track all of our cases from CIDT to culture confirmed cases. And we report, as I said, all of that information to them. And they rely heavily on every bit of information that we provide to them. So all the information that you collect on the local level is extremely important to us. So I wanna show you um, what's trending now, year to date, as far as cases reported. The highest um, species that's currently uh, trending is the Vibrio parahemolyticus, and that is in each particular region, the Atlantic region, the Pacific region, Gulf Coast, and non-coastal. So um, we are exactly where all the other regions are right now. And here you can see where we're at for non-coastal. And I wanted to give you time to ask any questions that you might have for Jennifer and I. So no questions from the field. If you do end up having a question um, at a later time, please feel free to, to contact Tracy or, or Jennifer, and I'm sure they'll be able to, to help you with your, uh, with your questions. And there's your contact information right there. Thank you, ladies. Next, we'll go ahead and, and ask Nancy Hamilton to come up. Nancy's going to uh, speak to us today about uh, Campy, and she's got uh, some documentation uh, slides as well. She's going to share with us. And uh, so, th Nancy, thank you so much for coming today. And uh, we're going to pull your slides up here. And there you go. And I'll here. Thank you. <coughs> and just let uh, Casey know when you need those other slides pulled up. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Nancy Hamilton, and I am a nurse inspector, registered nurse, nurse inspector in the reportable disease uh, section and the Department of Public Health. And I am here to give you an update on uh, campylobacteriosis. It's one of those big words. We like campy. Okay. So when I give um, this presentation, one of the things that you might notice is that I will repeat 
things, and I'm not just repeating them for just the sake of repeating them. They sometimes um, information goes in different places, and then sometimes we just want to reiterate so that you will remember. Uh, I won't repeat it seven times, but I think you're supposed to hear it seven times in order to uh, remember it. So hopefully you'll have the slides to go back and remember it on. So today I'm going to discuss and hopefully clarify some information um, that is vital to a correctly completed CAMPI case investigation uh, before it's submitted to the reportable disease, um, where we will confirm it. So all information is vital to the investigation um, on this disease, but sometimes you cannot get the entire information at one time because um, maybe you can't reach the case, or maybe the case is just a poor historian, or maybe they're just busy and they don't want to talk to you, or maybe they just don't want to talk to you. So you'll have to try numerous times to get back in touch with them, but go ahead and get as much information as you can when you first talk to the case, submit it, and then you can always add more information later. Um, I've also included a, a foodborne, waterborne questionnaire with words required, optional, and preferred. Um, that is in a uh, separate uh, little handout. And hopefully this is going to help you better understand what is needed um, in NEDS. Even though all information is needed, some is more important than others. So on the course objectives today, there you go. So on the course objectives today, we're going to understand how CAMPI is transmitted, where in the world do I get it, how CAMPI cases are classified per the case definition, and identify how CAMPI uh, lab criteria is used for diagnosis, once again, case definition, and then a complete NEDS uh, foodborne and waterborne questionnaire. Um, if you have your case definition in front of you, you should never have any problem with how to identify uh, the case, if it is a case of CAMPI and how the lab uh, will categorize it. Okay. There's our little motile, comma-shaped, gram-negative bacilla CAMPI in a disease. It's just floating around out there. So there are 25 species within the genus Campylobacter, but there are only two that are most commonly associated with diarrhea and patients who have diarrhea, of course, which are the Campy jejuni and the Campy coli. Those are the two that we see the most. There are others as you can tell by, by reading um, in the PowerPoint, but the two that we are most concerned about are the uh, Jejuni and the Coli. Once again, if you will have your case definition in front of you, and this is where you find it, you should be able to identify uh, what is needed to be reported. Um, the You will also notice that it has a 2015 date on it, and that's because CDC has not upgraded, has not uh, changed the definition or the regulation, or the, I'm sorry, not the regulation, but has not changed the case definition since then. Um, if the date changes, you should still be able to uh, go to CDC and find it. The reportable disease regulation, the 902-KAR-2020, which Tracy um, mentioned earlier, for all of our diseases, CAMPI is listed under the must be reported within one business day. So the provider has to call you at the local health department. They can't get you if it's on a weekend or something, they usually call us. Um, but it does have to be reported within one business day. Incubation time for Campy is a two to five day. It could have a range of one to 10, to 10 days, but it's going to depend upon the dosage that you took in. So just be prepared that it won't, it may or may not last the two, two to five days, which is not textbook. 
excretion of the campy organism, that could last for two to three weeks. Um, without a prescription, it could last, or without treatment, which possibly would be with a prescription, it could last up to seven weeks. During this time, you are infectious because you are still shedding the campy. So person, but we will tell you that person to person uh, is not common, but it can be done, but you usually are going to pick this up from touching a surface or um, with animals. And we'll, we'll, we will talk about that. Um, you, can, you know that the outbreak is over when you have two, two period, incubation periods of 10 days, which would be a total of 20 days, and there's no new onset. So with you, when you get that, you can declare your outbreak as over. How is, how is campy transmitted? Basically, this is an enteric disease that is transmitted, transmitted, transmitted by fecal oral route, uh, usually through the ingestion of contaminated food or water or through direct con contact with contaminated surfaces or infected animals. Not so much from person to person. You've got to wash those hands and those surfaces just to, to get rid of camping. So the routes that are norm, that are pretty common are the ingestion of um, undercooked meat, particularly poultry. It needs to be um, cooked at an internal temp of 165 Fahrenheit. Unpasteurized dairy products like raw milk or eating foods that are made with the raw milk, cheese, yogurt, that type of thing. Um, other contaminated food or water such as your well water. If you have uh, contamination in the runoff into your well, you could get it that way. And also if you have direct contact with the feces of kittens, puppies, or uh, farm animals, if they are infected. Proper hand washing is what's going to help you and prevent you, is the best prevention for this disease. So wash, 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 soap, water, antimicrobial soap, wash those hands well. Signs and symptoms of campy are abdominal cramping, of course, with the diarrhea, because you mostly have uh, abdominal cramping with diarrhea. You're gonna have some bloody diarrhea. It doesn't have to be. If you have a fever, um, I will tell you that most people say, I'm just hot, I, I had a fever, but they're not, they're not able to tell you what their fever is or was. So per CDC, if no thermometer is available, if the person had fever and chills, then they're considered that they probably had a fever. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention is a lot of people are confused about malaise and fatigue. Malaise is when you just don't feel good. There's, you can't really put your finger on it, but you just don't feel good. And fatigue, of course, is what you feel every day when you go home from work. You just feel tired. So there's a big difference in the uneasiness and uh, what's causing me to be sick, I just don't feel good, and knowing, you know what, I'm just tired today. So fatigue is not a symptom of campy, but malaise is. And malaise is a, a symptom of a lot of your diseases. So there's a little uh, help you, a little help you note for uh, the difference between fatigue and malaise. And of course, nausea and vomiting goes without saying, we know what that is. So treatment of these signs and symptoms, and for campy, it's mostly treating the signs and symptoms is what's going to make you feel better and good hand washing. So, of course, we need rehydration because of the diarrhea and the vomiting. We need to rehydrate and build those electrolytes back up and have the uh, um, 
different ways that you can do that is to drink water or Gatorade or Pedialyte or juices. Just get as much fluid in as you can. Um, medications are a choice of, I'm sorry, there, it, you can have meds to treat campy, but, but it's not really suggested and um, it's not really recommended. They usually just want you to flush out whatever's in there and um, just treat the signs and symptoms. Um, hospitalized patients, you use standard precautions with them, but if you have to have contact with them and they have diarrhea, then you are um, recommended to have uh, contact precautions as well. Okay, we're gonna talk about excellent, excellent hand hygiene. So you're gonna wash your hands with antimicrobial soap and you're gonna sing the ABC song or you're gonna sing happy birthday twice and you're gonna wash, and I'm giving a little demonstration now, you're going to wash your fingernails, you're gonna wash your hands, wash the wrist and just scrub, 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 scrub with warm, hot, soapy, microbial water. And so, so that's how you're going to get rid of that camping. You, you need to do that after you go to the bathroom, after you handle raw poultry, that little chicken that you're cutting up for dinner, um, personal hygiene on infected people, or contact with a stool of dogs, cats, or farm animals that are infected, particularly puppies and kitties with diarrhea. The surfaces that you use to cut that chicken on, which is your cutting board, and the utensils you use should be washed with hot, soapy water um, after coming in contact with raw poultry and before the next usage, just to make sure. Wash them after and then wash them before you use them again, just to make sure. Okay, if you have vegetables and fruits and they come in contact, or salads, anything, any type of food that comes in contact with the juices of raw poultry, you should just throw them away. Just throw them away, not the poultry. Throw away the fruit, the veggies and the fruits. You cook the poultry at to 165 Fahrenheit internal temp. Um, the plate that it was on, you need to just go ahead and put it in the dishwasher or wash it with soap and water too. Um, cook, as we said, we're going to cook the poultry to 165. Do not drink raw milk or eat uh, foods that have been made with uh, unpasteurized milk. Make sure your water and your uh, pool water is tested and make sure it meets public health um, regulations. So you want to exclude all people who have active diarrhea from food handling, hospital care of patients, daycare centers, and custodial homes until they are asymptomatic. Once they are, um, once they're asymptomatic, they just need to use you know, good hand washing. You want to clean surfaces that have come in contact with possible. Uh, uh, can be with one part bleach to 10 parts water. And wear gloves when you wash because you'll, you might need to put lotion on your hands afterwards. So, okay. Infected food handlers and hospital employees who are um, asymptomatic may return to work if they promise to use proper hand washing techniques. You again, you sing your happy birthday or ABC, happy birthday twice or ABCs and use that warm soapy microbial water. Don't forget your nails between your fingers and the back of your hands. Stool cultures of asymptomatic exposed to children are not recommended. Infants and children in diapers who who have symptomatic infection should be excluded from child care or cared for in a separate area until they are um, asymptomatic. If they're there, wash your hands well. Wear gloves or wash your hands. 
if you are the person that's taking care of them. Clinical criteria for a classification of on campy is an illness of variable severity commonly manifested by diarrhea, which is frequently with bloody stools, abdominal pain, malaise, fever, nausea, and vomiting. That is your clinical criteria. Once again, if you have your case definition in front of you, you won't have any problem when you're going through the case. Laboratory criteria, and I will say that this is coming directly from your case definition. Laboratory criteria for a diagnosis, if it is probable, that would mean any test that identifies can be by a CIDT, by, such as rapid antigen, PCR, GI panel, enzyme immunoassay, quick K test, whatever they do, if it's not a culture, it would be probable. A confirmed test, and only confirm if Campy is isolated by culture, then it will be a confirmed case. Also, if you have a person who's been in close contact with another person who has met the probable or confirmed criteria for diagnosis for camping, then they are epidemiological, epidemiologically linked. Here's another word for you. <laughs> this could be, and, and it is a probable case because it was not cultured, so it's a probable case. This could be a roommate, you, someone you work in close proximity to, someone you share a bathroom with, or you cook with, or you eat with, share sleeping arrangements. Any of these things that's, that you are in close contact with another person who has been told they have campy, you could be an epidemiolo epidemi epidemiological linkage. You could have that. So be sure and tell those people to go to their doctor and be tested. Okay, now we're moving to the case classification. A probable case is a case that meets the probable laboratory criteria, which is any test that is not a culture or a clinically compatible case that is epidemiologically linked to a probable or confirmed case of camping. A confirmed case for a case classification is a case that meets the confirmed laboratory criteria, which is culture, isolated by culture for diagnosis. A case should not be counted as a new case if lab results were reported within 30 days of a previously reported infection in the same individual. So if you've been reported twice for campy within 30 days, you only get one report. You only get counted one time. Now I will I will tell you that campy, you can be reinfected with campy over and over. Um, if you don't practice your good hand washing and if you come in contact uh, with the disease. So you may, you actually may see people who um, meet that, that criteria that have been diagnosed uh, within 30 days. Okay. Now we're going to talk about NEDS, that wonderful NEDS system. So there's been some confusion, um, people calling and wanting to know what fields are pertinent to the case in CDC and which ones do I have to fill out right now if I can't get all my information. So I have in a separate um, mailing, there is an actual NEDS example with the words of um, 
required and preferred and optional on there. So you can use that as a reference guide if you need to. We have that same. Do you want us to pull that up? I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's just for their enjoyment. Okay. But thank you. But if we do need it, it will be good to be able to pull it up. Thanks. Okay. On the very first page in NEDS, under the, um, the patient, the case information, CDC would re would love for us to have, and they, they pretty much require it, but I understand that you can't always get this information. The case name, you have to have that for identification. The date of birth and age, you have to have that to go with the person to identify. You need an address, at least a county, so you know where the case lives so you can take care of them, uh, so the right county can take care of them. And the ethnicity and the race, um, CDC tracks this information. So they would, they would love it if you could get that information. This information is on, um, is found on the patient tab of the foodborne waterborne uh, tab, and it's also <coughs> um, in the NEDS, the first page in NEDS. So that information will be found. There's two di two different places to put that information. Okay, so when you get a report, you hear a report in your county that uh, you think a person that has camping, you're going to get a lab report from the lab or from the doctor, from the hospital, from someone, you will get an actual lab report. So your progression and in your investigation is that you get your lab report, you, you put that lab in NEDS, and we will talk about where, where exactly it goes. And then you do your investigation and you get as much information as you possibly can. And once you get as much information as you possibly can, you send that notification through on NEDS to me or to um, reportable disease. Then you're done with that part, but if there are changes to your case or you find more information, you can make your changes and send it um, send it through to us again. Did you, did you want to finish your slide? I am so sorry. I apologize to all out there. I'm busy talking. I've only done this to my dog in front of my dog, so I didn't have to change anything. Okay. And now it doesn't want to change. There we go. Okay. If you have, well, first of all, let me tell you that you do have an example um, for this, and it's got, uh, it's the actual patient file um, screenshot. If you have an actual lab in front of you, you want to enter it under add new, oops, sorry, under the lab reports section on the events tab. This is where, if you enter it here, I can see it. Everybody up here can see it. We don't have to search for it. So if you get a new lab, you put it under labs, add new, not morbidity. Now we understand that some labs come through morbidity from the hospitals, but if you have the lab in front of you, enter it under lab report not morbidity. Okay, so the reporting facility name is the name of the laboratory performing this test. The ordering facility provider is the medical professional who ordered the test, the lab test, and their facility. So be sure to enter the lab report date and the date specimen collected on this on this under the lab enter new enter the new lab i'm sorry and make sure that those dates are not the same because they will be a different date for each of those so make sure you're entering from the lab to the report what the lab is asking for what the lab report is asking for <coughs> excuse me 
excuse me. Okay, um, additional comments or the name of the laboratory, if you cannot pull it up under the reporting facility should be entered in the administrative comments. Now, let me talk to you just, just a moment about and reiterate something that was spoken about earlier by Jennifer. If you are entering information in a box, an information box, at the end of everything you type, please insert your initials and the date. I learned that Nursing 101 um, because if you don't, then no one knows where my comments start and yours ended if I don't put in uh, some sort of a sign there that, or a space or something. So please put your initials and the date after you have typed what you want to type in a comments box. Okay, thank you all for that. Okay, so now you're going to attempt to interview as promptly as you can because it will improve their recall. Um, you want them to have as much food recall and recollection as to where they were and what they were doing as possible. So in order to do that, you need to interview as quickly as you can. You need to accurately and completely fill out each section in NEDS and the Foodborne Waterborne Questionnaire. You can use those the guidelines of what is necessary um, to get in as quickly as you can as to other parts that um, you can send in a little bit later, which may be optional or uh, not particularly required. And you can look at your NEDS form that I gave you. Any unusual information or information that you don't have, um, you can use the comments section to write that in. Always note loss to follow up, but you've got to show how many times you attempted and what measures you used to attempt to find them before you mark it loss to follow up. And I believe you have to do two or three times. Um, do you all know? I, I really don't remember off the top of my head. I'm sorry. It's two right now. Is it two? Okay, thank you. And some of it can be local policy. Like we would do um, two letters and then a certified letter after leaving mm -hmm. messages. So it could be what your county um, requires you to do, but at least make an effort to attempt, uh, an effort to contact them and please let us know how you did that. Just so CDC will be happy with that and not reject it and want to know what, what was used. You need to document, as we just said, the number of, t of times that you attempted and how you did. And if you contact a person, you can ask them if they seem to be hurried or something, you can say, you know, is there a better time for me to call you back? Or um, can you call me back? Uh, you know, just, just try to get information, but don't try to, um, if they need to go somewhere, don't try to make them stay on the phone because they may not talk to you later. If you, if they, it is okay to contact the case, uh, and you may have to do that multiple times, always provide education and prevention. And you can use slides seven through eight and 10 through 12 for that um, information or for guidance if you um, need that uh, guidance for uh, education. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, now this is not the lab report. This is the case investigation. So the investigator is the person who is entering the data um, in the computer. This is the name of the person at the health department. The reporting organization is the name of the health department. The reporting provider is the medical professional who's taking care of the case. And then on the um, diagnosis date, the illness onset date, these are important for tracking in case there is an outbreak. Um, not only do we use that date, but CDC would use that date. 
the diagnosis date is decided by the health care provider. So you're going to have to get their notes to see what that date is. Now the onset date is going to be per the case and they may know and they may not, depends on what type of historian they are. So you'll, you'll need to um, get those dates if, and the onset, excuse me, the onset date if you can, but the diagnosis date you should always know. If the patient has been hospitalized, <coughs> pardon me, if the um, if case is still in the hospital, make note of that in the comments. If they have been admitted and discharged, and you, kn you know those dates, and you should because of the, the notes from the uh, hospital or the doctor's office, put those dates in and also list the total duration of the stay in the hospital in days because if you list admission date and discharge date and you don't put the days, CDC will reject it. Um, and then we'll have to fill it back out and send it back to them again. If the date is unknown or you don't know if they're out of the hospital, just put that in the comments section. Okay, enter the EpiLink information, and this is if the patient lives with someone or is in close contact with someone who has been identified as having Campy, and they need you need to get that information of the name, where they work, just as much information as you can um, about the EpiLink and how they're linked. Um, Always enter the confirmation method, and if diagnosed by a lab that does not identify Campy by culture, it's a probable case, and you would choose laboratory report, and the case status would be probable. You would use, um, okay. so if it's culture and it's confirmed, and it's laboratory confirmed, it, it's laboratory confirmed. If it's a CIDT, it's probable, and the laboratory report is what you use. So probable, you do not use a confirmed. You use the laboratory report. Okay, and if you have questions about that, you can send them to me. I think my information is at the end. I know it's a little confusing, but we, we go over it all when it gets here and we make sure it's right. If Campylobacter was identified by culture, it's confirmed, you would choose laboratory confirmed. If it was a CIDT, it's probable. Okay. Um, to submit the notification, you need to, to submit it as soon as sufficient information to meet the case definition is available. When you get those bare basics and it meets case definition, send it through. Additional information, as we said before, can always be added if the interviews have not been completed or um, you get more lab results in. So if you get, you send me a submission um, of a notification that has some information that might not, might be confusing, I will send information back to you asking you to clarify that information. Now, the way we do that, CDC has a little box that they call in NEDS, I'm sorry, it's in NEDS, a rejection box. This is not rejection to you at all. This, that's a horrible word to use for that box. This is just, a, that box is just a means of requesting additional information to make the case as accurate as possible. Please do not take offense at that. We would change the word if we could. But it's just a way of quickly notifying you that I need more information and then you just send it back to me. That's all that is. So um, before we hit talk about this reference, the reason it is so important for me to know the name of the lab that um, and how they reported Campy is because I have a list of labs and they and how they report 
So if your laboratory reports by culture, but the test that was sent to DLS was not identified as Campy, I can still count that as a confirmed case because the original lab did a culture. So please, please, please do your best to tell me the lab somewhere on the lab information of which lab was used. I would really appreciate that. Okay, these are the reference materials of where we got the information for our campy plus our case definition. Now you notice the books are, were done in 2015, so if they're upgraded, and, um, then um, the pages will change. So just be aware of that. Also, our contact information is here, and I included Carol Rush because she is the waterborne, uh, foodborne waterborne uh, diseases, and I'm just the, I'm the nurse, just the nurse for Campy. So uh, you can contact either one of us, and there is a secure fax line on there. If you have questions, if you want to send them to nancy.hamilton at ky.gov, I will certainly answer them for you, and I'll send them out to the entire group. And I thank you for your time, and don't hesitate to call us if you need us. Thank you, Nancy. You're welcome. Are there any questions from the field for Nancy? Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Nancy. All right. You're welcome. I always learn something from the reportable disease folks when they come and present, so thank you so much for the great information. Um, while you all are here, I've got a room full of reportable disease folks. Can someone give me an update on the status of the reportable disease desk reference? I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but... Yes, it's been sent out to different people to uh, review. Okay, okay. So, and it will... It, it might be just a little while because we... Okay, so... But so we are reviewing as, okay. to make sure the information is correct and to make sure that um, content is there and that we don't... Need okay. To so I'm not sure if you heard Nancy or not. We mentioned on a couple of our previous public health nursing webinars that the reportable disease desk reference um, will be soon released with updated uh, information, updated references, updated format, a new and improved to scrub down. And I, I am very excited about this uh, project. And thank you all to each of you all who have been working so much on it. Kelly's point to the other side of the room. <laughs> so right now, uh, the status of the reportable disease reference is that it's been sent out to others um, in, at local health departments in the field. Um, actually, expertise. Oh, okay. Expertise. Okay. So, a state state subject matter experts. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. And then when the when all that information is uh, returned and and compiled, considered and compiled then we'll be able to release that. You all may know that there's a link in the CCSG for the reportable disease reference. So go ahead and use that one. We weren't able to get uh, the timing uh, aligned with the release of the CCSG and the new reportable disease re desk reference. But we've been in conversations uh, with NEC and, and reportable disease folks about another, lo uh, an additional location, I should say, uh, perhaps where we might be able to post the reportable disease mm -hmm. section. You know, you all know where um, the AR is and the CCSG and the WIC manual. We, we've kind of been bouncing that around as potentially an, uh, an additional site where the reportable disease desk reference might also be added as a as a hyperlink. So more to follow on that. I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, make, you know, provide that update since we had everybody here in the room. When it's ready to go out, it will also be sent. You know, we'll give it to you to send out to your nurses. We'll send it to regional FBs. Okay. So we'll send everyone the link. Okay. And, and um, Kelly mentioned that. Uh, once the link is ready, then they will send it out to the director, local health department directors and regional EPIs, and then they'll forward it to me, and I'll send it out to all of all of you all, um, so you all can have that uh, readily available at, at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. And and Tracy, I will uh, be in touch to schedule a time for an E. coli presentation. So thank you for making that offer. And then lastly, I wanted to thank Christy Boland um, 
and the ERRT committee who approved the session. Um, if you all have questions about how to obtain uh, documentation for today's uh, session for your ERRT credit, please contact Christy Bowman and she will be able to help you with that. Next, I'm going to introduce um, a, a new friend and colleague, and then I'll, I'll have with me a friend and colleague um, who I've known for quite a long time. Uh, are y'all going to come up together? Or are y'all going to do a tag team? Or how are y'all going to do this? Tag team? Okay. So first of all, um, I'd like to introduce Bob Ford, who is the surveillance coordinator for the HIV Prevention and Control Program here at DPH. Um, Bob and I just recently met, and uh, a great opportunity for him to come and share with us uh, information about HIV um, surveillance documentation. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about where those forms will be housed, Bob. And we're going to pull up your presentation here. Is that what you're giving her, Gail? Uh -huh. Okay. Bob pulled together a, um, a brief presentation this, uh, this morning. Uh, so he's already been hard at it. So what I'll do is I'll send that out to you all um, after, the, after today's webinar. So Bob, thank you so much for being with us here today. And then we'll have, whenever you're done, just let Gail know and we'll have her come up, okay? Let me show you here what you've got. Thank you. You're, and you're welcome. Your camera's right there. The speakers are out right here. Okay. And then you'll just advance your slides right here, either with the arrow or your mouse, okay? Okay. And then they'll be able to see your PowerPoint. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Uh -huh. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I am new in the position. I've been in the surveillance coordinator position for about six months. Um, wanted just to go over a couple of quick highlights about the new adult case report form that you received in your email update from Joy. This will replace any CRFs that you already have in house. Um, and as before. We do want the patient uh, to know, we want to find out why the patient or how the patient was infected with HIV. So we want to talk about their risk and report that on the adult case report form. Uh, as with the previous presenter, the CDC is very clear about asking for um, a lot of stuff. They want the names of the facility where it was tested. They want the date. They want the type of test. Uh, anything that you have with collection dates, et cetera, is going to be required on the adult case report form and the pediatric uh, case report form as well. The adult case report form is for somebody who is HIV infected, and you will still need to complete the HIV test form one for all HIV tests that you conduct in your uh, county health center, and part two of the HIV test form for any positive cases, as well as the adult case report form. As the diagnostic diagnosing provider, the local health department will need to complete the adult case report form within five days of receiving the results, the positive test results from the lab. When you do make your report, we would ask that you include any HIV negative test for that consumer if they've tested at your local health department prior to their positive test. We are here to help you with that. We can do it by mail. You can fill in the form and send it to us, or you can contact us at the number on your screen, 866 510-088, uh, and we can help you fill out the form over the phone. That's all I have. We're going to come back in August, Joy, I think yeah, you said, yeah, and, talk a little and, bit more. and we'll talk a little bit more about it. And if you have any questions or have any concerns, please let us know by calling that number, and I'll be happy to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Gail Yocum and I'm the supervisor for the HIV prevention program and just wanted to speak with you briefly about um, an exciting plan that we have. We have uh, plans to um, roll out a new rapid test which is called the NST and let me see. Oh, oh, there you go. Perfect. <laughs> That's what the package looks like. Um, throw it up here again. So everything is self-contained in this packet. It's a CLIA wave test um, and you get your results in 60 seconds. So the, the beautiful thing about this is it takes less of your clinic time 
to provide the HIV test and to get the results to your patient. Uh, we're going to start with the syringe exchange programs because folks who are coming in for services there are anxious to um, get their new syringes and move on. Uh, but we do encourage all health departments who have SEPs to uh, encourage folks coming in to get that HIV test and hepatitis if you're able to provide that. And um, we'll follow up with um, starting to roll out the health departments with the NST, and uh, hopefully we'll have that all completed by the fall. So it's a very simple test to use. Um, as I said, everything is contained in the one packet. Um, it requires three little vials to mix into um, your base. It's very quick, uh, easy to read, very easy to read. So uh, we hope that you'll like this test. We've had very positive feedback from uh, the folks who have been using it. And it is a finger stick. Um, but we don't have a lot of complaints from uh, clients who are using it. So um, we will be working with you to set up a time in your region to come and train. And once you have an individual trained at the health department, they're able to train other people. So um, you can send one representative to the meeting and get them trained and then they can train the rest of the staff. So uh, we'll be providing some more information about this in August, and we'll also be talking with you about changes that are being made to the HIV test form. Uh, CDC has directed Luther Consulting, who um, developed the test, which gets reported into Evaluation Web, to uh, revise the form and include some new fields. So uh, hopefully those changes will be um, completed by the August meeting and we'll be able to share that information with you. And just to end, I want to thank all of you for your efforts to promote HIV testing and to uh, encourage you to make that part of your routine care for your patients that come in. If they come in for um, a test for another STD, please talk with them about including the HIV test. Uh, some people assume that that HIV test is part of that uh, blood work that's done, um, but they need to know that you need to ask them if they're willing to have that done and to encourage them. And kudos to all those health departments out there who are really promoting it and talking with their patients about risk factors and getting those HIV tests done. If there's anything that we can do in our uh, prevention office to support your efforts, please let me know. If you need uh, any kind of educational materials, we have a lot of brochures and pamphlets that we would be happy to pass on to you. Thank you. Gail, we have a question. Oh. Um, the questions about the SOGs and when those will be available, I'm assuming you'll be able to have that information ready for August or when do you anticipate yeah. that release? Yeah. We have that now and uh, can start sending that out to um, all the health departments. Are we with the question mark? I don't know if I heard you. Do we say it again? Yeah, just tell them the question. We, we have those SOGs available now, so we can um, start sending those out to you. And um, our representative from Biolytical that makes the NST test has sent us uh, several reference materials that we can also forward to you. We do have the video available, and we have plenty of time to show that. Can we can we take this opportunity to show the instinct video? I don't have it. We have it. Oh yeah. And you sent it to me, and we uploaded sure, it. Sure, that okay. would be fabulous. Okay. <laughs> if, um, we, if we can get it to work. There's some really good training videos that uh, talk with you about the test. Yes. yes. So we'll take a chance to look at that, and yeah. then you can ask questions afterwards. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Let's try the second one, maybe. It's not going to cooperate. Uh -oh. 
this was looking good. Done. Once the sample has been transferred into bottle number one, the sample diluent, recap the bottle and mix well by inversion. Open the sample diluent and pour the entire contents into the center of the membrane unit well. The sample should be absorbed quickly. Wait for all the liquid from bottle number one to be absorbed completely. Resuspend the color developer by slowly inverting. Mix the solution thoroughly until the reagent is evenly suspended. Pour the entire contents of bottle number two into the center of the membrane unit. The solution should be absorbed quickly. Wait for the solution to be absorbed completely. Open bottle number three, the clarifying solution, and pour the entire contents into the center of the membrane unit well. The solution should be absorbed completely. The clarifying solution will reduce the background to provide more contrast to the spots and facilitate reading. Immediately read the result while the membrane is still wet. Do not read the results if more than five minutes has elapsed following the addition of clarifying solution. When reading the results, make sure the tab of the membrane unit is orientated towards you. Non-reactive result. One blue control spot that is clearly discernible above any background tint should appear on the membrane. The control spot indicates the test has been performed correctly and a human specimen has been used. Reactive result, two blue spots. One control spot and one test spot that are discernible above any background tint indicates that the specimen contains HIV-1 and or HIV-2 antibodies. 
Following a reactive test result, HIV confirmation testing should be conducted. Invalid result. The test is invalid if there is no control spot on the membrane. An invalid test result means that the test was run incorrectly or insufficient specimen was added. Invalid test results cannot be interpreted. Any invalid test should be repeated with a fresh specimen using a new membrane unit, kit components, and support materials. The INSTI-HIV Rapid Antibody Test Kit is intended Well, that's okay. She's going to pick it up here. Yeah, okay, pick it up. Okay. All right. Is that it? Just a second. Did we lose them? <laughs> Thank you so much um, to Bob and to Gail for the heads up on the new forms and the new testing that's uh, going to be available to local health departments. Um, I invited them to come today just as um, kind of a part of a heads up. This information would be uh, forthcoming um, because I know that August will be a busy time for everyone with school starting and immunizations. And I just kind of want to get ahead of the game as far uh, for you all to let you all know this would uh, this new uh, uh, testing uh, opportunity will be on its way and be rolled out gradually through the local health departments and as Gail starts mentioned starting with the um, the uh, needle exchange programs <clears throat> the um, and then I also sent out the links um, those were in the Dropbox for today's course so you'll be able to review those and use those for staff training um, if needed I also wanted to share with you all that the forms the um, HIV test form one, uh, as we mentioned during the CCSG updates, that will be added to the CCSG uh, form section, as well as the pediatric case report form and the adult case report form. So we'll have a new section, uh, Casey will be working on that. Uh, we'll have an, a new section in the forms under the forms heading for HIV forms, and those th three forms will be available to you all uh, beginning uh, uh, the July 1st um, format of the CCSG. So are there any questions for Gail? And it's the question is, are we changing the HIV rapid test due to cost? I can see a larger chance for error with the new test. Get out of your way. Oh, yeah. You're fine. <clears throat> uh, we are not changing it due to cost. We're changing it because it is uh -huh. the best test that is available at the time with the high specificity and sensitivity. So uh, we are always looking for um, the test that is the most accurate to provide to our clients and patients. Um, there is a little bit of cost difference, but nothing significant. CDC has directed that we move away from oral fluid rapid testing. Um, so that has um, always been a um, uh, first choice in Kentucky to use the OraQuick oral fluid rapid test, and we are moving from that test. We uh, are currently using SureCheck, which is a very good test, and the syringe exchange programs uh, will continue to use the SureCheck um, as they'll be doing the rapid, rapid algorithm with INSTI as the first test and SureCheck as um, the second test. And after that second test, individuals can be referred right on to a medical provider or a Ryan White program for linkage to um, medical treatment. I'm not sure of the reason um, that the caller felt like this test had greater uh, probability for error. It's a very easy to read test. It's a blood test, which CDC recommends as uh, the most accurate and uh, which provides the best results. So um, the people that are seeing it are not um, reporting any problems with the test or reporting any false negatives. Um, so if you have specific concerns, you're welcome to call me and we can discuss that further. Thank you.
Are there any other questions for Gail? Okay, all righty. Uh, just for a moment, I wanted to I remind everyone from a CLIA uh, certificate perspective, this is, uh, as Gail mentioned, a CLIA waived test. Um, so you'll be wanting to go ahead and be thinking about uh, uh, updating all of your CLIA waived uh, training uh, forms, uh, your list of who can perform this test. Uh, policies and procedures, so forth and so on. So your CLIA documentation will be up to date to reflect the new INSTE test. Anything else, Gail? Okay. Thank you so much to you and Bob for coming today and providing a brief update, and we look for more in August from you. Okay, you'll be back. All right, thank you. <coughs> Next, it's my privilege to introduce Gary Franklin. Gary Franklin is the uh, Program Liaison Advocate for the CADA uh, Options Purchasing Program. And so Gary and I have had some uh, great conversations here in the past, and uh, we, we really thought this the PHM webinar format would be a great opportunity to uh, share this this program with the local health department nurse leaders. I shared with, with Gary that oftentimes the nurse leaders, um, nurse supervisors are the ones who are um, assigned or charged with, with purchasing uh, clinical supplies for your local health department. And so we wanted to be able to reach out to you all and share this information. Your, the local health department directors, your directors have also received this information in previous CADA meetings and with CADA being the uh, umbrella group for all of the, uh, for the local health department directors. So this is another a group that we, um, we identified as a, a great group to, to speak with and share this, this opportunity to save some money and at the same time buying quality uh, products for, for your agency. So Gary, I'll ask you to come on up and we'll get your, your PowerPoint pulled up for you. All How are right. you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Thank Good. you, Joey. Good to see you. I believe we're gonna have to make an adjustment on the camera here though. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Six foot eight and 245. So. <laughs> Thank you so much, Joy. Uh, may I go now? Yep, let's see. We're going to pull your up pull your PowerPoint up. just one second. Well, thank you for having me here today. I am so excited about this program. This is something that we started about two years ago. Everything has been tried and tested and over the years, we've tried to find ways to save money. We call this the Kentucky Health Department Association Options Purchasing Program. Now, I'm Gary Franklin, and my contact information will be up a little bit later, so you'll know how to reach out to me. But the Options Purchasing Program, I am the CADA Liaison Advocate. So I work on your team. I work with you, and you run this program, you meaning the nurses and the staff at all the public health departments. You'll see the puzzle pieces and that's what this is. We're putting a large puzzle together as we do this program. So if you'll go to the next slide, please. Joy. You can just arrow oh. over if you want. Uh, okay, yeah. there you go. Um, I always tell everyone this, if it's true that public health in Kentucky is the fabric of the community that it must be true that the nurses are the thread that tie all this together and i believe that i personally will be eternally grateful to our public health nurses i want to share a very short personal story about public health in kentucky because this is why i'm standing here today uh, about 12 years ago my sister uh, 13 months younger than i am um, found that she had breast cancer, had four children at home, all of school age, had no insurance and not many opportunities to get better. And you all have heard the stories, you know how this will be out in the communities. Um, I worked in with medical supply companies for most of my career. 
um, I asked my sister what she wanted to do, and she said, I have no idea. It's a hopeless cause. Yeah. And I said, well, it's not hopeless. We just need to find you uh, some treatment. Um, so I said, I have a relationship over at Lincoln Trail District Health Department. Let's go there. And when we got to Lincoln Trail, the nurses there took that as a mission that day. And I remember one of the nurses said, we've got this. Just step back. We've got this. And from that day, she was in the doctor, the surgeon the next day and had surgery and uh, treatment. And today she's and I think she's in Florida this week enjoying a vacation. It's because nurses do what nurses do is the reason why my sister is here today. And public health, to me, has always been where that's at. So I turned my career towards public health, and I've been in it pretty much um, for 30 years now. And I'll be eternally grateful to all of our nurses for that. And that's why I'm doing this program. So if you will go to the next slide. What's the options purchasing program and how can it help our county district health departments and health departments? Well, we developed this program to identify cost saving opportunities. If you know anything about what's going on in public health today, we need to save some money. We need to find ways to purchase products at a lower price. Every health department and every health district in Kentucky does something similar. Um, they go out and they search for vendors. Uh, they may solicit bids. Uh, they'll find this vendor's got this and this vendor's got that and try to cobble together the best prices. What happens with this program, the way it is, and the way it has been is a lot of this falls on the nurses, don't have a lot of control over the products that they're purchased. They may get an inferior product because of price. It's the nurses that need to decide a lot of times what that product is and what should be used there, along with the uh, administrative staff, of course. But the nurses are the ones that use these products. So I feel like that we had to find a program to create that we could find these national contracts and local contracts. So what this did is we created a series of national pricing contracts and regional pricing contracts within the CADA network, working with other vendors to be able to do this. And when we utilize the combined volume of all the health departments and all the health districts, we can negotiate our pricing based on that volume. So if you're in a small geography in Kentucky, we can work with your volume in that small geography, as well as a large geography like Jefferson County, and use that combined volume to negotiate our pricing with. Each county is already a member of the Vizient Group Purchasing Organization, which is our national GPO. I'll tell you a little bit why that's important in this presentation. Being a member of the GPO means you're already connected to all of the national pricing contracts. Even if you haven't participated in this program to this date, once we enroll with a single piece of paper, once we enroll you, you'll be a part of that and then connected to all the pricing contracts. Now, this is not a bid situation. We don't have to do any extensive paperwork. Today, in fact, you could call me after this meeting's over with and you'll have my contact information and you can say, I'm excited about this. I can see, Gary, you're excited about this. We want to be on this program. And I can get your facility linked in and signed up. You do not have to sign any contracts to be a part of this program. That was the big thing. That's what we worked on within CADA, was making sure that you didn't have to sign up for something that you didn't want or didn't need. You were able to participate as an option for your facility. This is your program. It belongs to you and it'll always belong to you. So because it belongs to you as the nursing staffs and our public health departments, you have the ability to bring products to me and say, Gary, I've been looking at this for a long time. 
we can't get any good pricing on this. How can you help us find a contract price that we can live with so we can afford to have this in our public health department? That's where I go to work for you and work with you, the nursing staff and the nurse leaders to identify where our best pricing is and how to get that locked in for the smallest county and the largest county. If you'll go to the next uh, slide. Once enrolled, what we are trying to accomplish is initially to see at least a 20% savings on medical office and janitorial products. No funny money. The reason why I put that there is because you hear these stories about, oh, if you do this, this, and this, and if you switch to this segment of products over here, and if you buy 500,000 this year, you'll be able to get a 20% savings. And to me, that's just baloney. That's funny money. That's a shell game. What we need to do is be able to identify the products that serve our communities best and the testing devices and the needles and the bandages and you name it and then be able to negotiate a good price and share it with every public health department out there in Kentucky. And that's what we do. Regardless of the size of your county, you will get the same price as the largest health district in the state. That is our mission. That is what we decided to do with this program and it's working so far. Options means this within this program. We call it options because you have the ability to purchase from another vendor if they offer a great deal, or you can stay with our prime vendor program, but you have many different options. You're not pigeonholed into buying from one company. We didn't want that to happen for a reason. And that was very simple because if a vendor came in the door and said, we have these great uh, testing devices on sale this month, and it's only going to be a one month thing. You let me know about that. And I'll make sure that that vendor is able to sell it to you for that, as well as your neighboring counties, because that's what those vendors need to understand is they need to offer that across the state. Uh, the medical supplies our prime vendor right now, and we did this for a reason as Concordance Healthcare Solution because they have a very nice online platform and their breadth of product and a nationally recognized company. So they go coast to coast. But we're also accessing our office supplies from a Kentucky company, which is Kerr Office Group. So they have a nice online platform as well. Now we're working on some of our regional supplier agreements right now. In fact, we've got one coming up here pretty soon that we're working on. So we should have that completed in July. So you have the ability to save. And I'm hoping that what you'll find in this presentation is the eye opening. I didn't know this program was out there. I'm learning something new about this and I wanna get on board because You've seen the Uncle Sam posters for you. We want you. Well, I need you. I need you, the nurse leaders in this state, in this commonwealth, to step up and say, <laughs> let's all work together to one common goal, and that's to save money. How do we do that? Well, it's by national GPOs. If we're not utilizing a national GPO in your county, we should be, because here's what happens. There's an account in Western Kentucky that was purchasing BD 5.4 quart sharps containers, regular red uh, flip top, I think, $130 a case is what they were paying. Rather than switch to a lesser quality, we just accessed the national GPO agreement and found the price drop to $67 a case without doing anything, just by accessing the national GPO. That's the power of using everyone's volume to negotiate price, but it's also the power of the national GPO. I put this in here because I believe this. I'm not just saying it. I believe it. I believe it. It'll be the nurse leaders that drive this program to success. We know that health directors are sincerely very busy every day. 
health directors have this on their plate over here and this and this and this and this gets put over here and it's they take it seriously but there's a lot on their plate we know nurse leaders have a lot on their plate too but nurse leaders are the ones that use the products and evaluate the products i use peer groups all across the state to be able to evaluate products uh thanks goes out to christian county because they have been wonderful about looking at products. In fact, they evaluated our latest nitrile gloves that we wanted to put a pricing contract together. And they were able to do that, loved them, and we put a contract together. But they also did the peer group testing on our uh, PTS uh, cardio check. Um, and that, that was a few months ago and they did the peer group testing on that. So we really appreciate Christian County doing that but also all the other counties that have participated in that. It'll be the nurse leaders that drive this program to success. We understand that you've got a lot going on because you're a nurse. You have a lot going on, not just a nurse, but you're an administrator. So you have a lot going on with your employees as well. But I need you on my team building the options purchasing program to success. To this program will be the difference, in my opinion, and probably shared by many, that in the coming years, as the money gets tighter and tighter, we can use this program to leverage better pricing. And those savings will result in being able to save not only staff uh, positions, but also to be able to buy new equipment, to develop all of our testing out there to look at new testing devices and new equipment. I think that's where this savings can go. If you go to the next slide, one of the areas that we look at all the time and we do this every day is we negotiate with manufacturers on different products. This is the Assure Prism Multi, a blood glucose monitor. Well, on the marketplace right now, there's probably 50 blood glucose monitors out there. And you can get strips from a number of different places. But what we did was we negotiated with this company. If, if they will do something with us, we'll do something with them. So what they did was said, we'll give you the meters at no charge. And we'll give you a phenomenal cost on your strips. You can get a bottle of 50 strips for this meter that's been approved by the state laboratory. You can get that bottle of 50 strips for $10. And that's great because I've got health departments right now buying strips at $90 a bottle for the same amount. What we are trying to do is identify cost savings across the marketplace, not just on blood glucose, but on gauze, on gloves, on everything that we use. Lead testing came up the other day. This has gone all the way to mosquito spraying out in the field. You know, can we get a better costing on those chemicals? Um, can we get a better costing when we buy uh, vehicles for our health departments? So we're branching this out, but for right now, medical office and janitorial, that's what we're going after. So these meters are available to anyone and I can get you as many of them as you need and a great price on the strips if you're going to. Uh, this has been a hot topic for months now. Go 365, you all are familiar with the program, the lipid profile. Um, many of you are using Cholestech, and I think that's a great technology, Cholestech is, and I'm not urging you to get away from that. But we did find another analyzer out there that's a handheld device, uh, state approved. We did the peer testing on this. And uh, we found the results in 90 seconds versus eight minutes. Now, what does that mean out in the marketplace? Well, it means that if you're doing 100 patients out in the field in some type of a health fair for a company in your local area, that that eight minutes could be 90 seconds. And that means a time savings for your staff to be out of the facility and things like that. Um, we also found that the control material was a lot longer for this or stayed stable a lot longer. 
and there's a special placement program available. I don't have that in front of me right now, but we have placed, we probably have 12 counties right now that have moved to this technology versus the Cholestec technology from Alir. But let me preface by saying again, both technology work fine and they're both great. We just found that this one, this company really wanted to integrate their technology into Kentucky's public health and they made a Kentucky Public Health offering in a contract price. So we've been placing these out there in the field so far. If you go to the next one. Kate Options Purchasing Program, well, our goal is to reduce prices on medical, office, and janitorial supplies and to identify cost savings opportunities. It seems like I say that over and over, but I feel like I have to because I get questions all the time about what is options and what does it do and what can it do for my county? This program is something that you as a nurse leader can work with me on one-on-one. -on -one. You can call me, I can come to your county. We can work electronically together. We can identify what's going on in your county. We've already got a lot of counties on the program, but I, I am shocked at the amount of counties that have said, well, we're kind of looking at it, but we've been satisfied with the way we've been doing business for years and we feel like we've got a better deal. I want to just say this. We started this program. Every day our prices get better because we constantly negotiate new prices. So every day in the options program, our prices seem to go down. We identify areas where we're high and we work on those areas to get them down. That's something that you're not able to do if you're not in this program. Every county, smallest county, largest county, largest health district, smallest health district, everyone gets the same price. That's where you're helping your neighbor in Kentucky identify better prices within this product range. So I'm going to leave this open for questions right now because I typically have a lot of questions. Uh, Joy and I talked the other day about, she had heard from someone else uh, that told her about this program. Yes. And there were a lot of questions that we went over and I thank Joy for having me in to talk about this sure. because, sure, you. you know, getting in front of this and getting with the nurses, this to me is where it's at. I put my information up here because you have access now to my cell phone. You can email me at the options purchasing program at gmail.com anytime and I'll get back with you and we'll work together on those things. But also, Today's the best day to join Options Purchasing Program. It does not cost you anything to join. It's a one-page form that we fill out to be able to access that pricing. If you're not in the Options Program today, I don't understand why you wouldn't be, because it doesn't cost you anything and you're not having to sign some long-term deal. Plus, you get access to everything out there that we've been doing now for the last couple of years and we're moving and shaking we've got new things coming all the time um i'm very proud of the program as you can tell so today i issue a challenge to all of our nurse leaders out there in kentucky first of all thank you for spending the time to watch me this morning but also the challenge is look at what you all do in your county just reach out to me because this week I'm going to do a blitz. Those that haven't signed up, I'm going to be reaching out to the individual nurses in the counties and saying, can you go ahead and sit down with me or let's talk about this over the phone and let's get signed up this week because we want to make sure that we don't grow stagnant. We always want to keep moving in the direction we need to move. It's a CADA program, and I'm very proud of this CADA program, and I don't have a reason why you wouldn't be in the options purchasing program, but if you do have a reason why you haven't joined or don't want to, share that with me so we can get better. 
even at the end of the day, if you decide that you don't want to be a part of it, tell me why you wouldn't be a part of it. And maybe we can work together to find an answer to that. I know Joey and I are going to be working together in the future on a lot of the things that she does. And I certainly want to work with you too. So once again, there's my contact info. I urge you to write that down right now to make sure you have that. And I'm going to give just one more option here to be able to ask me a question about this program. If you have nothing, certainly join. I've got a couple of questions for you. Sure. Um, if a nurse leader was interested in uh, purchasing a particular item from through the options program, is there a list available of, of uh, items that are on the list? I'm glad you brought that up because we talked about that about a week ago about it changes so often. It's a fluid list. I've got a new one and it's ready. I'm going to send that over to you so you'll have a copy just in case any of your nurses are going to come out and need that. Okay. Uh, I've had a couple other people request that. We have a formulary of products that we keep adding to. I'll be honest with you, the, pro the formulary started out with about 125 items and now it's up over 348 items, I think. And it just, we keep adding things onto that. So to answer your question, yes, there is a formulary available. Um, the, online, you can go online and within the prime vendor for the program, the national prime vendor is Concordance, but we're gonna be working on some regional uh, opportunities here in Kentucky with companies that are located in Kentucky that you'll be able to work with them as well. Okay. We just wanna make sure that everybody gets the same price from those companies. Absolutely. And then my second question, Gary, is I see an FAQ, an FAQ list here. I did that I, when we first started. I just made, wanted to make sure you had it in front of you. It's great. And do we have, um, okay, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, yes, uh, this question for you, Gary, is uh, can you share the information on the great deal you are offering on gloves and syringes? Thank you, Roanya. Roanya is a teammate of mine in developing this program along with Allison Adams, the um, CADA president. Uh, we put the program together and thanks for Roanya for bringing that up. Uh, we have a SemperMed deal right now. We, we found that everybody was using something different on every type of uh, nitrile glove out there. You know, there's 1500 brands worldwide of gloves. What we just needed was the best glove at the best price. We needed a high quality glove for public health, something that wouldn't tear off every time you tried to pull it on, something that had a cuff that would fit good. Uh, we wanted something that when a nurse evaluated a glove and a staff member wore a glove, that you wouldn't have chronic failures on that glove. We found that SemperMed had the gloves that we were looking for. We evaluated the gloves at Christian County and we came back now. They're available 250 each gloves in a box for $9.32 a box on contract. Now what that means is that, I don't know, Joy's been in nursing a while and, and I've been doing this for a while, but I remember when nitrile gloves first came out they were $15, $18 a box. So, and that was for a box of 100. So now we've gotten that price down to where, you know, 250 in a box versus 100 in a box. And we're getting those now for $9.32. As far as the syringes are concerned, um, the national GPO contract that we're on is Visient. Most uh, nurses and most health departments are utilizing BD syringes. That, that has always been the flagship for needles and syringes. I think Monoject was the other. Uh, that's what we all grew up using and have all sold in the past or used in the past. We needed to access this great GPO contract pricing on the gamut of BD needles and syringes. And we have that now with BD. We have BD on contract. And I think you'll find that you can save more than 20% on just needles and syringes. Also, the needle exchange programs that are out there right now, 
Well, we found a line that's a subline that we can put out there and evaluate. We can send you some samples to try those in that process that are much lower than even the contract price on BD. So I don't want to be too confusing about this, but we have options on top of options for what you do in your regular clinic days for inoculations. And we have options on what you would do in your needle exchange program. These needle exchange programs are, I don't want to say loss leader because the reason why we do the needle exchange program is because for public health. So we want to be mindful of that, but there's a lot of cost that goes into that bringing those supplies in, but nothing coming back. So we need to find ways to narrow um, our loss as far as what we spend for those syringes. And we found that MHC has a very nice syringe needle combination that the bevel on it is very sharp. And I know those nurses out there have given so many shots over the years that they'll find that that sharp bevel is what everyone looks for. You don't want to have to plunge that in. You want that needle to slide in. MHC has a really nice cost-effective alternative there. So our next question, Gary, is uh, from Lexington Fayette Health Department, and they have a, a very large needle exchange program, as you may know. Um, they use a lot of needles uh, through that program. They have uh, that the syringes. They have found that uh, many times the insulin needles that they have ordered through Monoject uh, through concordance are on back order for weeks. And of course they need those to be readily available. Is BD going to, uh, those BD supplies going to be able to be received any uh, quicker? Good question. And thank you, Kimberly, for uh, asking that. Um, for Lexington Fayette, by the way, it's a good time to say that their um, Monoject needles, I think were released on Monday. So they should be getting a big back order in. But that was a national back order for a company that sold needles and syringes, not necessarily the distribution arms out there, the Concordances, the McKesson, the Grogan's, you know, the head wolf, the head on their shelves. And that's what happened there. They just happened to order it through the options program through Concordance, but it was on a national back order because that particular syringe and needle combination for these needle exchange programs they just ran out in the manufacturing process, but they did release on Monday. Now, to answer the question, she said, well, is it faster to get the BD? At this point, because one company had a national back order and both are on the Vizient GPO, I would personally believe that the BD would come in quicker. Um, I think I reached out to them the other day to talk also about MHC because there's a backup to if we have a national back order on one, that we would have a, a backup to the other. The caveat to this is always, if we know what the volume is that you're going to be ordering, then I can make sure as a liaison to contact Concordance and say, they're going to order, for instance, Lexington Fayette, 80 to 90 boxes twice a week. You better have 80 or 90 boxes on the shelf or they're going to order them somewhere else. So to answer Kimberly's question, that is what we would need to do. She, uh, I think they gave me their volume the other day and I did find out that the back order was released. So. And she did say in a follow-up response that they received her shipment. Thank Good. you. Thank you very much. Good. For that. Well, that's me working with the distribution arm of this to find out, hey, we've got a problem here. Yeah, we need to fix it, right? <laughs> supply and demand. We need to fix this and fix it rapidly. Yes. I'm coming up on my time, you're, but you're we fine. have, do we have a few more questions? And I'll give this just a few minutes to ask those questions. I want to tell you something. I believe in... I don't want to stand up here and wave a flag, but I believe in our public health system. I do think that our county health departments are the fabric of our communities. Without public health, we, we are not the society that we want to be. And I have believed that ever since uh, I got into this industry, but especially 
when my sister fell ill years ago. And I tell that story a lot, but not because I want to use that to say, oh, I know what you know, I'm talking about. I wanted to say that because it's public health that has her here today. It is Lincoln Trail District Health Department that flew into action. And my story and my sister's story is something that happens literally every day. So without public health, we don't have the society that we want. Now, we also know that we have to be vigilant every day about these supplies, what we're looking at. We get so much money every year, so we got to spend it wisely. Why not look at the options purchasing <coughs> program to be able to do that? Why not work with me as a team to be able to do this? I have another question here. Uh -huh. That's for Rowania. What is the typical turnaround time uh, for an order delivery after the order has been placed and the shipping price and the shipping price on average? On the national supplier, which is Concordance, they're located. Uh, their warehouse is located in St. Louis, and it is typically two days. Right. So uh, we want, we like to say if you will place your order on Monday, the items in stock then you get it in two days. Um, unless it was a control material or an emergency situation, you really don't have to get your items in the next day sitting on the, your dock by Federal Express. You certainly can, um, but you don't have to do that. We also have an agreement that if you order $150 total, you get free shipping. So that was a way that we were able to narrow down some of our margins and to work with our national vendor, our prime vendor for the GPO, to be able to work with them to get them to ship the products for free. Uh, I'm working with other vendors right now to do the same thing. As I said, office supplies and janitorial supplies are all under contract now, and that's free shipping. Uh, you can have that available anywhere in Kentucky as well. As you know, can liners weigh a lot, so they have a truck line that will be able to bring them. I want to reach out also to Graves County. Um, Graves County had had an issue to where they were bringing a tractor trailer truck to deliver to their county. And we've been working on that for a while. This is where the liaison part of this comes in, where I call them to say, there's not a dock there. So you need to stop delivering their supplies by truck uh, to to a place that has no loading dock and put it on a Federal Express truck or a courier van or whatever. So that's where I work together with the customer to work with the manufacturers and suppliers. Um, do we have any other questions right now? Not right now. Well, I'll give it one more minute and I don't want to type any more right. of my time, but what I was saying about the program I'm proud of this program. As you can tell, I'm excited about the program because we finally have something that we have put together as CADA with the input of our health departments, our partners, our, um, our vendor partners across the board, our manufacturers, to put together a program where you can access the products that you want without having to go to a product of lesser quality. That's the way everybody seems to want to save money was, well, if this is too expensive. How about we go to this? Well, how about let's get the more expensive one. Let's just negotiate a better price. So I think we've been successful doing that. As I said, this week, Joey, I'm going to go on a blitz uh, and look at the counties that are not on yet. I'm going to be reaching out to your nurse leaders to say, help me help you. If this person over here is the supply specialist, maybe you can work with the supply specialist to say, we need to be on the options purchasing program. I know this is on your desk. Can we go ahead and get this done? And I think the proof is always in the pudding, isn't it? Um, we need to save money and we found a way to do that within this program. So I'm going to put the proof in the pudding here by saying, I'll guarantee if you'll work with me, we can find ways to save money within this program in your county health department. Once again, I'm so grateful to be here in Frankfurt and to be working with Joy on this and with all of the lead nurses 
and nurses across the Commonwealth. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much, Gary. Thank you, Joy. Um, on this F FAQ list, mm -hmm. can you send that to me electronically? Absolutely. Okay. Gary has sent, uh, has provided me with a, a list of 13 uh, questions and answers about the options program. Yeah, she's going to adjust the camera here. I'm not quite as tall as Gary. Um, and so we'll send this out to everyone electronically. So the speaking points you can share and review with your uh, the uh, your local health department director. Uh, you know, your director could, or you can use this information with your, if you're speaking with your board of health, uh, so forth and so on. The folks who actually make the purchases, um, your, your uh, admin staff who help you with those uh, procurement requests. So I'll send this out to you as well if you'll, if you'll zap that to me electronically. And um, I wanted to. And I, the product list. And the product list. You're going to send me that link as well because that's what we'll need to, to, uh, you know, for the nurse leaders and the directors to see what's available. Um, and I also wanted to thank Allison Adams, who is the local health department director at Buffalo Trace, and Rowanya Rice, who is the local health department director at the North Central Health Department District. Um, both, both of those ladies are also nurses, and they were um, very open and receptive to Gary coming today and sharing this information uh, with the nurses. Uh, with you all, the nurse leaders and um, your your colleagues in the field, Gary will be with us on, at the next NEC meeting, and we'll talk about uh, perhaps various ways we can uh, maximize our partnership, um, uh, disseminate information, so forth and so on, and and get some direct input from the NEC for further um, partnership endeavors. Sound like a plan, right. Gary? Okay. So appreciate it. Thank okay. You, so. All right. Thank you. All righty. So we're going to wrap up here. Thanks, Gary. We're going to wrap up here. Um, I've got a few announcements. A lot of uh, a lot of uh, busy times, as I mentioned earlier. As far as I want to talk about the CCSG, uh, the release date, uh, effective date. Uh, will be uh, is uh, Monday, July 2nd. So Casey and I uh, are working uh, furiously on, on that, getting that all prepared and ready for its release. We do have a new, as you all are aware, a new website. Uh, and so Casey, uh, a new website format. So Casey went to the training this week and we've gotten her access. And so we've had a few extra steps on the uh, on the process, but we're going to uh, still work and do our due diligence to to get that ready and for you all to to uh, implement into your clinics on Monday, July 2nd. <clears throat> there was a couple. I want to mention just a few of the forms for you all. Um, I inadvertently left off the CH2 form that Debbie Donovan uh, mentioned during the CCSG uh, presentation, the overview last week. Um, so she did cover that, um, but I for failed to send it out. And so I apologize for that. I'll send that out to you all today. Um, Debbie did cover it. And so I just wanted to let you all know that would be posted. Um, uh, the new and current version would be posted for the July 1st uh, CCSG in the form section. And then we had a a uh, request that came in uh, right under the wire uh, from a local health department who asked a uh, nurse leader who asked if there could be some uh, slight uh, changes made to the hepatitis C infection risk assessment documentation tool um, that was reviewed by Kathy Sanders and approved through the uh, reportable disease a program. <clears throat> the questions that were added uh, and and uh, formatted into this HCV2 documentation form were to help streamline the data collection process and to go ahead and prompt the nurse to ask those questions um, so they would better know how to proceed uh, with interventions for that client. So the questions were, um, I have tattoos. Uh, either professional or non-professional. I have body piercings, professional or non-professional. 
and I had been in jail or prison. So um, just wanted to let you all know that those, were, those questions will now be added to the infection risk assessment for HCV screenings. Um, I will send this out also uh, today or tomorrow, and I'll highlight those sections so you'll know uh, that where those questions were um, added. And thank you, um, Anne, and thank you, Kathy Sanders, for uh, making those changes readily available. Those um, We had these questions asked uh, last year and the year before, and we somehow didn't get those revised, and so I wanted to go ahead and honor that request. <clears throat> And then the, the three HIV forms that I mentioned to you earlier when Bob Ford was, was uh, after his presentation, you want to be looking for the HIV uh, test form one, and then the pediatric case re report form, and the adult case report form. So those will now be available to you uh, on the CCSG website under the forms section. If you have any questions about those additional documentation forms, please let me know and I'll get those out either this afternoon or tomorrow for you all. <clears throat> then I wanted to discuss the APRN conference. I've already started to receive several um, emails and calls about the conference. And uh, the, this is the time of year when everybody starts thinking about the conference as you all are working on your, your uh, schedules for three months out. <clears throat> Um, Glenda, I'll get with you. I'll answer that question in just a second. Um, so I've contacted, I wanted to let you all know that the date has not been set yet for the APRN conference. However, I have been in a communication with Dr. Glenn Farr, who's the pharmacist and uh, the um, uh, gentleman who provides our training from the uh, pharmacology training from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And he's been our pharmacologist provided our pharmacology uh, CE, the five-hour mandated CE for our APRNs. He's provided that for the last um, eight to 10 years. And so he's uh, agreed to come back again this year. Uh, we will be having uh, hosting the uh, APRN conference at my old Kentucky home again. I'll tell you what I do know. Um, and then also uh, I have a conference call scheduled this afternoon uh, with Correct Care Solutions who is, as you all may recall, the um, clinical, the, the vendor who provides clinical services and all throughout our state prison reformatory systems. So I have a, a conference call this afternoon with their director of nursing and they're um, going, they're very excited about partnering with us again this year. And so uh, I'll be talking to, uh, to uh, Correct Care Solutions and more information will be coming forth, coming to you all as soon as I can get that the date uh, confirmed, hopefully today or tomorrow. <clears throat> if you all, if you uh, would like to, uh, I'd like to invite the APRNs, um, those of you all who um, attend the conference, if you're nurse leaders or not nurse leaders, but provide, uh, you know, direct clinical care services, uh, the, the APRNs would love, I would love to have your feedback and input on any agenda topics that you all would like us to uh, cover and identify speakers for. Um, please let me know and we'll do our best to fulfill, satisfy that request. The, uh, Glenda had asked about the administrative reference. Um, I'll just take a step backwards just for a second. Um, the administrative reference uh, is, uh, scheduled to be released on July 1st as well. Um, that publication uh, is uh, published through Local Health Operations Branch and the Division of Administration and Financial Management. Um, the last I heard, um, and as far as I know, they're on schedule uh, to release that information uh, for July 1st implementation as well. Then, um, that's about, that's the status of the APRN conference. I know that you all do like to schedule um, and do schedule um, three months out. So we're already looking at September, probably September or October, um, you know, for those, for those conference dates. We try to avoid those two weeks 
uh, for fall break the first two weeks in October, and certainly we want to have the conference, uh, help. we want to hold the conference before our um, KBN deadline to get our nursing CEs by the end of October. So some time between September and, and uh, the end of October. Um, I wanted to also mention to you all the uh, nurse leader orientation. We've not had, we've not offered a nurse leader orientation, although we do have a great need and I've received many requests for an orientation. Uh, so I will um, I'll be uh, offering that uh, hopefully within the next couple of months. Uh, I don't have an exact date, but I do have a great agenda, which uh, the nurse executive committee has helped me pull together it looks like it'll probably be a day and a half um, uh, full of uh, lots of great speakers and uh, information that we feel like uh, would be helpful to a new nurse leader, whether she um, is coming uh, up through the ranks through a local health department or if she's coming from an outside healthcare entity into public health. So um, as soon as I I uh, can get that rounded up and, and on, on the calendar, I'll be sure to let you all know because that, uh, I know for certain that's a great need. We have a lot of new nurse leaders and we want to be there to provide that technical assistance and guidance for you in order for you to better uh, uh, feel prepared and equipped to perform your job. And lastly, I wanted to share with you the Nurse Executive Committee will be meeting next week. Um, as I think I've mentioned a couple of times, the times the Nurse Executive Committee has worked diligently with the Division of Laboratory Services for um, to enhance and increase and add to uh, the information that's available in both the Administrative Reference and the CCSG for uh, laboratory services and uh, including tools, uh, documentation tools, quality assurance tools that will be um, published in the July CCSG. So thank you again to the Division of Laboratory Services and the Nurse Executive Committee for all of your uh, leadership, comments, input, and hard work in making those two, uh, both the AR and the CCSG, uh, those um, policy and guidance documents, uh, real world and more applicable and more beneficial to local health department nurse leaders. I know they uh, sincerely appreciate that. I've already gotten some great feedback from several local health departments on those on that information. The other another um, subject that we're working on is the development of a respiratory plan a template that <coughs> local health departments. Uh, can use for the development and implementation of a uh, respiratory control plan within your local health department agency. Um, documentation, uh, the documentation policy guidance will include um, N95 uh, fit testing guidelines, uh, OSHA guidelines, um, uh, documentation or, you know, guidance as far as if a local health department has a negative pressure room or they don't have a negative pressure room. Um, and we wanted this to be, and other things, we wanted this guidance to be um, bigger than uh, solely TB. Um, so we wanted to have it more broad. Uh, we've brought in uh, what we've developed, um, and thank you to Angela Kick, to um, uh, the nurse in our prepare, new nurse in our preparedness branch. She's convened a group of uh, several um, stakeholders, both internal and external, uh, including the Kentucky Department of Labor and the OSHA, our OSHA subject matter expert, to develop this documentation um, and resource guide, uh, more of almost like a toolbox uh, for local health departments. So uh, we have Dr. Kenneth Alia, who is um, a occupational med physician who is working on his MPH at the University of Kentucky. And so he is helping us compile uh, this information. And so we've gone through um, the first draft. Um, we're meeting uh, hopefully next week. Yeah, next week, because he's uh, his, 
his uh, rotation will be through will be finished with us uh, next week um, and so we'll be able to send this information out um, as soon as it's available as well so uh, if there's uh, if there are local health departments who may not have this guidance that is readily available to you if you're a new local health department nurse leader and you don't know where to start um, on your respiratory plan or, or yours is um, your agency's respiratory plan may be um, old and yellow and curled up and you need to knock the dust off of it. Um, we, we, uh, our intent is to provide the most current and user-friendly guidelines for the development of a respiratory plan in your local health department. So mm -hmm. remind them that if they need, um, if they still need assistance with fit testing, um, like a demonstration, someone to come show them how to do it, et cetera, or just advice, call me. Okay. If there are local health departments for whatever reason, if you still need um, assistance or uh, training on how to conduct N95 fit testing for your agency employees, um, Angela Kick, K-I-K, -K, is her last name. Uh, she's at her, she is available. Her contact information is in the uh, DPH Global email, and she will be more than happy to visit um, your local health department and teach you a, you know, kind of a hands-on uh, demonstration and help you uh, get everybody caught up in your agency if you uh, if your team if your staff is has not been recently fitted for an N95 mask so she's a wonderful resource please feel free to reach out to her and you know if you want to call and just talk to her first of all about what you have um, some local health departments reach out to their neighboring hospitals and have a contract with them with their infection control nurse to provide that service for them. So whatever that looks like in your local health department, that's 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 fine. <clears throat> but if you do want to provide that service internally um, and you have that need for training uh, and you don't or you don't have that that capacity like you used to, please feel free to reach out to Angela and she'll be glad to to help you. Um, and then lastly, we'll be talking about the next NEC meeting about Gary Franklin's uh, and the options program through CADA. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, when he left, uh, better ways, perhaps enhanced ways we can disseminate information to local health department nurse leaders and local health departments in general to um, be the best fiscal stewards we can of our, our money, both at the federal level and state level and local level. Um, to be able to purchase the quality items at um, the, the best cost possible. Our next public health nursing webinar will be Thursday, August 16th. So please mark your calendar and I hope you can join us. And uh, thank you so much for all that you do. We've got another question here. Yes, all the new forms will be accessible on the new website. Yes, Kathy, they'll all be out there uh, in the form section under the new link uh, for the, the new link for the July 1st, 2018 CCSG. We'll get those all added for you. Are there any other questions for, for me or information that I can um, collect for you and, and send out? Okay. Well, thanks for everything. We're going to end a little bit early today. Uh, it was a full, full uh, webinar, and so glad you could join us. Uh, the The archived session will be available in a couple of days, and if I don't talk to you uh, sooner, I will talk to you on August 16th. Take care. <laughs>